Welcome to day three of the Exploring for the Future program showcase. My name is David Robinson. I'm the head of the Basin Systems branch at Geoscience Australia, and it's my pleasure to be your moderator today. I would like to begin with an acknowledgement of country. Geoscience Australia acknowledges the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and acknowledges their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to the people, the cultures and elders, past and present. At Geoscience Australia, we acknowledge that our mission to be the trusted source of Earth Sciences information is preceded by tens of thousands of years of knowledge gained by generations of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. I want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of that wisdom and of the lands, waters and skies where we work, live and learn. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders are Australia's original mappers, miners and navigators. This is the heart of our work. And we have so much to learn from their many thousands of years of related knowledge. On Monday, Andrew Heap outlined the vision for the Exploring for the Future program and introduced our impact pathway while emphasising the outcomes and impacts on the right hand side. Yesterday, those that joined heard talks and discussed data, toolbox and geology themes on the left hand side. Today, we will focus on the systems and resource potential themes. Before we get to that, I want to highlight that the work we are showcasing is the result of extensive collaborations, and we acknowledge these up front. Our valuable partnerships span Australian government departments and agencies, state and territory governments with whom we collaborate for all of our work, the MINEX Cooperative Research Centre, and the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy Facilities and lastly, universities across Australia and the world. We thank you all for your support. Our first session is focused on growing our understanding of mineral, energy and groundwater systems across Australia. The speakers are presenting on behalf of a large team, including many scientists, administrators and other professionals. Our first speaker is Dr. Sarah Buckerfield, who will talk about improving the groundwater surface water system understanding of the Upper Darling River floodplain. Sarah is a hydrogeologist in the Groundwater Geoscience Directorate. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Geology and Chemistry from the Australian National University and a PhD on hydrological and land use controls on groundwater contamination in Southwest China. Her focus is on the integration of multidisciplinary data sets to provide groundwater system understanding for sustainable water resource management, but at any given time would probably rather be doing field work. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Sarah and it's my pleasure to be presenting some of our results so far from the Upper Darling floodplain groundwater module. I am presenting on behalf of the project team here at GA and a whole range of other people, um, both within and outside GA, who've been incredibly helpful uh, and fundamental to this project being successful. So our task is to characterise the geometry and controls on the occurrence of potable water resources uh, around the Upper Darling floodplain region. So within the context of the Murray-Darling Basin, um, we're up here in northwestern New South Wales and the project area is within the Red Polygon here. Um, so we're looking at the stretch of the Darling River between the confluence of these eastern headwater tributaries um, just above Burke down to just south of Wilcannia. The main source of water here is surface water flows coming down the Darling River. They are coming from rainfall in these eastern headwater catchments, which receive higher precipitation. However, they are also strongly influenced by the Southern Oscill Oscillation Index, which leads to the characteristic 
um, floods and intervening severe drought periods. That has consequences for communities relying on the surface water flows on the Darling River, but also for the recharge of groundwater within the floodplain sediments. So this graph shows the annual um, discharge coming down the Darling River, and that amounts to a 70% reduction in mean annual flow over the period of monitoring, which is almost a century. That's had some severe consequences for communities along the Darling River, with some communities running completely out of water and facing very low water quality, as well as a series of severe ecological declines, um, such as the fish kills that we have seen recently. Discharge of saline groundwater from the alluvium into the river during low flow periods also has consequences for the salinity of water in the river locally and for the overall salt load in the basin. So there are a number of strong imperatives for um, better understanding the distribution and sustainability of using potable groundwater reserves in this region. There are a number of groundwater systems in this area. The most relevant to us is the groundwater contained within the alluvium deposited by the Darling River over the past 65 million years or so. That's shown by this um, blue hash polygon, which is overlying everything. And the general direction of groundwater flow is from northeast to southwest, shown by those arrows. Aquifers of the Great Artesian Basin are shown in green. The Aramanga Basin here in the north contains several major aquifers, but they are at depth um, and separated from the alluvium by a mudstone. However, aquifers of the Surat Basin um, are shallower and connectivity with the alluvium may be significant, which is something that um, we will be investigating. The Darling Geological Basin uh, is generally low permeability. That's the, um, the white area here in the center and has groundwater reserves of low quality and low yield. So that's not considered a significant groundwater system. The sediments of the Murray Basin down here in the Southwest do contain aquifers of varying water quality. And the sediments of the alluvium are overlain and incised into the sediments of the Murray Basin. So understanding the connectivity between those aquifers of varying quality is, is important. These cross sections um, on the left just show the vertical relations between those aquifers. So on the top here, we have the alluvium of the Darling River incised into a mudstone of the Great Artesian Basin and below that, one of the aquifers of the Aramanga Basin. And that is based on some work by um, Trevor Mount in the 90s. The bottom cross section shows the relationship between the alluvium and the sediments of the Murray Basin. So the river has incised into the Murray Basin sediments and the Darling alluvium sediments are deposited over the top of and incised into those. I'm just going to go in a bit more detail into the groundwater systems within the alluvium. So this is a series of lithology logs, which uh, adjacent to the river and follow this red transect line here. What you'll see is that the um, depth of the bedrock varies substantially, which is due in part to block movements on a series of fault lineaments. Over time, this has resulted in variation in the composition of the alluvium as it's been deposited in the Paleo River Valley. The current conceptual understanding of um, the groundwater systems within the alluvium is a two aquifer system. We have a deeper saline groundwater system shown by the red arrows, which is deflected upwards over a bedrock high at at least one location where it discharges saline groundwater into the river and has resulted in the installation of a salt interception scheme. The second system is a shallower system represented by these blue arrows, and that is typically less saline and in some cases is connected with the river. But that's something that uh, is not well constrained across um, the entirety of the study area and something that we will be investigating. So we have identified in the earlier stage of the project a series of key knowledge gaps which need addressing to understand what is controlling the distribution of potable water resources. Uh, those can be classified as first order structural controls, so the geometry of bedrock and fault systems and the hydrostratigraphy within the, within the alluvium. These control the groundwater flow paths and how the groundwater systems interact with each other and with the surface water system. Secondly, we need to quantify those processes of groundwater surface water connectivity and the connectivity between the groundwater systems. So to do that, we have been completing a major acquisition program that's included a 25,000 kilometer AEM survey, um, along with water level analysis, hydrochemistry tracer data, uh, lithology and hydrostratigraphy, ground and downhole 
geophysics and remote sensing data sets. Uh, without further ado, I will <laughs> show you some data. So this is um, the Airborne Electromagnetic Magnetic Survey, which has very recently been completed. We are incredibly lucky to have this data set. It is giving unprecedented insights into the hydrology of the floodplain. We need to um, say a big thank you to our colleagues in the Geophysical Acquisition and Processing team here, who have uh, been fundamental to this survey happening at every step of the process and have turned it around in record time in, in order for us to show it today. For those who are not uh, familiar with an airborne electromagnetic survey, um, what we have is a bulk conductivity signature. And this particular image is showing the conductivity of the subsurface at 11 metres below the ground surface. Conductivity is influenced by the salinity of the groundwater. Saline groundwater gives a conductive signal and that's shown by the red and yellow colours. Fresh groundwater gives a resistive signal and that's shown by the blues into the greens. The picture is slightly complicated by the fact that uh, the mineralogy of sediments and rocks also influences the conductivity signature. So minerals, for example, present in clays give a conductive signature, while minerals present in, for example, granites or quartz sandstones give a resistive signature. However, with the appropriate supporting data sets, so geology, lithology logs, groundwater chemistry, we can tease apart what is causing this conductivity signature at different depths and at different areas in the floodplain. So on this image, you'll see that the floodplain is giving a very conductive signal um, above Burke. We know based on lithology logs that that's likely to be due to a thick clay drape, uh, about 20 metres thick in this area. Below Louth, um, in the central part, and then moving down through Tilpa to Wilcannia, we see an increasingly wide resistive zone. Based on the data sets we have, this is likely to be due to surface water infiltrating the groundwater system and recharging it with fresher groundwater. If we move down through into deeper depths now, so we're at 32 metres, you'll see that those resistive zones between Tilpa and Wilcannia are still there. And as we move, move further down, they are, they're changing slightly in their geometry and their location, but they're still there, likely representing um, sandy units within the alluvium containing fresh water. And the distribution of those sandy units changes laterally and vertically with depth due to um, their, them being deposited by the Darling River, which has meandered and moved across the floodplain with time. A few other interesting features to note are the resistive zones um, here, east of Whitecliffs, uh, south of Louth, and up um, west of Barona. Those are actually all due to resistive bedrock. As we get down to 60 metres, uh, and further to 80 metres, those resistive areas um, between Tilpa and Wilcannia are petering out. On our hypothesis that that is fresh water being recharging the alluvium from the river, we're starting to reach the bottom of that fresh water lens. And what we're starting to see um, more generally is a resistive bedrock signature coming through uh, across the floodplain. There's another interesting feature here, and that is this um, conductive meandering signature around Burke. And that's likely to be a paleo valley, um, which is full of saline groundwater. We will now have uh, a look at some examples of how we integrate the AEM data with other data sets and translate this to understanding of the groundwater systems and implications um, for potable water occurrence. So uh, this is a cross-section north of Burke, where we have a near-surface conductive signature. On the cross-section, you can see the location of the river and a small surrounding resistive zone in the blue-green. From a nearby lithology log, we can see a thick clay layer down to about 25 metres depth. Um, so that's the yellow here, which would explain such a conductive response in the AEM. Looking at nearby available groundwater and surface water pressure and chemistry data adds further information. We have the discharge in the Darling River in blue and the groundwater level in this sand layer here in black. So you can see that um, while there is large variation in discharge in the river, there's no response in the groundwater level. And similarly, the salinity in the river um, is 400 microsiemens per centimetre, while in the groundwater is nearly 13,000 microsiemens per centimetre. So that's very good evidence that the surface and the groundwater systems are disconnected. 
taking a contrasting example from the south between Tilpa and Wilcannia, we have a depth section that shows a much larger resistive zone extending vertically and laterally from the river. Um, so that's here. And again, the river location is shown by that arrow. An adjacent lithology log shows several shallow sand lenses, which are at an appropriate depth to allow migration of river water through bank exchange processes. Groundwater pressure data from three screen intervals within this bore reveals a consistently downwards pressure gradient over a long period, including low and high flow river conditions, which indicates that there are consistently the right hydraulic conditions for groundwater recharge from the river. So the next step here will be to obtain groundwater salinity data and residence time estimates in order to assess the rate at which this recharge is occurring. And another feature to note here in this groundwater pressure data is the consistent downwards trend um, at all levels. So that's likely reflecting the decreasing surface water flows in the Darling River. Uh, and it's just a reminder and an illustration of why we need to consider and manage ground and surface water resources of one system. So mapping this insight um, from the AM combined with other supporting data sets back to the question of the geometry of potable groundwater zones and controls on their occurrence, um, we've seen that there's a high likelihood of fresher water lenses around the river between approximately Tilpa and Wilcannia and that these may extend down to approximately 50 metres and laterally for several hundred metres. So this is likely to be due to a combination of sufficiently permeable hydrostratigraphy allowing lateral and vertical migration of river recharge and a downwards pressure gradient as a result of a change to unconfined conditions in the underlying Murray Basin sediments where the Darling alluvium transitions from overlying the low permeability bedrock of the Paleo Valley and coalesces with the Murray Basin. In contrast, there is no evidence of substantial fresh groundwater occurrence in the alluvium in the north. In the locations we've investigated, this can be attributed to clay dominated stratigraphy, preventing surface groundwater connectivity such that the groundwater found in the alluvium of the floodplain is dominated by the older saline system. There are clearly a number of nuances um, spatially and temporally to this story. Um, and I've just given you a few examples, but hopefully this has given some insight into our progress so far on understanding the extent and controls on fresh groundwater occurrence in the region. So that's just been a quick look through some of our results. Um, and I thought I would finish up with what we're planning to do with the data and the remainder of the project timeframe. So to delineate the geometry of freshwater lenses within the alluvium, we'll be integrating the AM with lithology, water chemistry and surface and downhole geophysics. And then to constrain the controls on the occurrence um, of those freshwater lenses, we're planning to conduct a seismic line to integrate with the AM and existing drill core data to better delineate the bedrock and fault geometry. We'll also analyse ground and surface water level data and conduct further hydrochemistry sampling to improve confidence in the identification of zones where the river is recharging the groundwater and detect zones of groundwater discharge during low flow conditions and estimate approximate residence times. That information is all um, imperative for assessing the sustainability of using a groundwater resource. So I'll just finish up by uh, saying thank you to a whole list of people. Without the help of all these people, we wouldn't have got to this point. So thank you very much. And please reach out to us with questions. Um, if not, um, after this talk uh, via email or, or calling. So I'll just close uh, by showing you this picture of some river redcombs, which are next to the Darling River. And they're one of those groundwater dependent species that rely on the recharge of the groundwater resources by the Darling River as well. So um, with that, I'll finish up and thank you for listening. Thank you, Sarah, for a great overview of the Upper Darling work. Our next speaker is Ladina Carr, who will provide an update on our activities to grow geoscience insights for energy resources. Ladina is the module leader for the onshore basin inventories in the Exploring for the Future program. She holds a Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Science from the Australian National University in Geology and Anthropology with honours in geology. She also holds a diploma in project management and a graduate certificate in writing. She joined Geoscience Australia 15 years ago 
and has worked in various roles across the agency, including in the minerals divisions and in satellite imagery acquisition. Currently, she works as a basin analyst in the onshore energy systems team. My name is Ladina Carr and this talk is titled Ge Geoscience Insights for Energy Resources. At its heart, the program is about stimulating industry to ensure sustainable long-term future for Australia through improved understanding of the nation's mineral, energy and groundwater resource potential. By gathering and analysing geological and geophysical data and making the results publicly available, this program supports regional development and informed decision making across Australia. It also seeks to improve the supply of gas and in the, in the immediate term and kickstart the hydrogen economy while also securing supplies of liquid fuel resulting in jobs and growth. This talk will discuss the results for two of Geoscience Australia's basin programs, the Office of Musgrave Project and Australia's Future Energy Resources Project, focusing on their work in the Cooper and Eremanga Basin. The results of this program will be to improve basin prospectivity and investment opportunities for Australia's onshore basins. This will be done by improving the geological knowledge for basin resources, providing new geological knowledge and data, and information for informed energy decisions. The Office of Musgrave Project is split into two modules. The first is the Paleo Groundwater Systems module, which has been covered in the last session, and the second is the Energy, Geology and Stratigraphy Studies module, which I'm going to discuss now. The Neoproterozoic to Paleozoic Officer Basin is an intracratonic sedimentary basin that covers large amounts of South Australia and Western Australia. It is a remnant of a series of central basins that were once interconnected, constituting the Neoproterozoic Centralian Super Basin. The Officer Basin is bound to the north by the Musgrave Province in South Australia and the Rudal and Musgrave complexes in the Proterozoic Patterson Origin in Western Australia. The Officer Basin contains up to 10 kilometres of, of marine and non-marine siliclastic and carbonate rocks with minor volcanics. It is formed as a, as a sag basin and extends across a wide area of Central Australia during the middle and late Neoproterozoic incorporating the present-day Amadeus, Georgina, Nalia and Officer basins. Numerous hydrocarbon shows have been observed throughout the basin, however yet no accumulations have been found. Reducing the energy exploration risk in the Officer basin is also a key focus of this project. There is sound evidence for the existence of several petroleum systems, high quality reservoirs and regional local seals. New regional scale data acquisition, including petrophysical and geomechanical studies from well and investigations into petroleum system elements, will assist in the exploration and evaluation of conventional and unconventional resources. Additionally, the Officer Basin has mineral potential, particularly for basin hosted base metal deposits. As part of the Officer Musgrave project, a series of stratigraphic analysis and data acquisition components have been undertaken to improve the geological knowledge of the Officer Basin. And I will present the results of these studies in the next few slides. The first study is a chemostratigraphic framework. The objective of this study was to undertake a bulk rock elemental chemostratigraphy on 10 historic wells in order to better correlate the Neoproterozoic and Cambrian sections. The study focused on acquisition of new regional scale inorganic geochemical data sets from the analysis of samples from historic exploration wells and integration with the seismically defined Centralian super sequences to build a stratigraphically consistent framework across the basin. Carbon and oxygen isotope analysis were also carried out on the selected carbonate prone units to improve the chronostratigraphy correlation for the Tonian and Ediacaran to Cambrian sections. Recent studies by Bradshaw and Kaida have highlighted inconsistencies in the interpretation of the sedimentary succession in the Centralian Basin, particularly across state borders. The Neoproterozoic to Cambrian sections are either non-fossiliferous or biostratigraphy is incomplete. Hence, chemostratigraphy was employed to create a detailed inorganic compositional fingerprint of each unit from which a robust well-to-well -well correlation could be made to determine the lateral continuity of the lithos lithostratigraphic units. This work has resulted in updating the stratigraphic columns of the Neoproterozoic to Cambrian successions after Kaida and others, and the new chemostratigraphic megasequences and sequences of the 10 officer basin wells. 
As part of this study, new petrophysical and geomechanical data sets have been collected and rapidly released to, um, to industry. These new data sets provide insights from new digital photography, X-ray computerized tomography scanning, unconfined compressive strength and tenthal strength testing, laboratory ultrasonic testing and gas and porosity and permeability experiments. Additionally, low permeability tests were also undertaken on select samples that were identified as being ultralight. This data is now available and can be downloaded from the link on the screen. Building on the petrophysical and geomechanical data collected and discussed on the last slide, further analysis of well logging data and interpretation has been conducted using both conventional and machine learning approaches. Conventional log interpretation generates the volume fraction of shale, effective and total porosity from gamma ray and lithology logs. The self-organizing maps, or SOMs, techniques cluster the well logs and interpret the petrophysical properties from conventional interpretations. In addition, artificial neural networks were applied to interpret the effective porosity and permeability from well logs. Conventional interpretation results and SOMs clustered petrophysical class indexes. This study indicates that the Neoproterozoic to Cambrian successions of the Officer Basin have potential to host both conventional and tight reservoirs. This work was presented at APIA quite recently by Wang et al. and is available through the link on the screen. Geoscience Australia has also commissioned the reprocessing of selected legacy 2D seismic data in the South Australian part of the basin. And you can see the lines here on the map top right. The seismic data package contains reprocessed data from five surveys acquired between 1966 and 1987. In total, it contains approximately 1,425 line kilometres of industry 2D reflection seismic data comprising 25 lines from five separate vintages. You can see here on the screen that the improvement in the signal after reprocessing and the location of this line is indicated by the red box on the figure. So this study provides new insights into the stratigraphy and wider geological knowledge of the Officer Basin. All data sets that have been released are now publicly available from the Officer Musgrave Project webpage. And we also have two EFTF abstracts um, for your enjoyment, summarizing all the data and science for this project. Now, onto the second part of this talk. In these slides, I'm going to be discussing the project Australia's Future Energy Resources. And this is a national project evaluating the potential for new energy commodities hosted within sedimentary basins. The project aims to un unlock the potential of underexplored sedimentary basins in central Australia. Australia's future energy resources is split into four modules. The aim of the project, as I said, was to unlock the potential of underexplored sedimentary basins in central Australia. Module one investigates resource assessments. In many of the basins, exploration drilling has failed to make commercial, commercial discoveries, but did confirm the presence of active petroleum systems. Examining why past exploration has failed will shed new light onto the, these basins and potentially offer new exploration opportunities. Module two looks to stimulate the hydrogen industry. New geological storage sites are being mapped for hydrogen fuel storage, including salt accumulations. The utility of geothermal resources in deep-seated aquifers is being assessed for hydrogen production. And importantly, the economics of blue-green and natural sources of hydrogen are being assessed to inform investment and government policy. And my colleague Andrew Feitz will be discussing the ins and outs of this project in the next session. Module 3 investigates the feasibility of enhanced oil recovery using carbon dioxide to boost Australia's petroleum resource potential while economically storing greenhouse gases. And Alex will be discussing this project in the next session as well. And the final module uh, assesses the current knowledge of petroleum geology and exploration history in several underexplored and frontier basins. And it will be captured to expand the National Basin Inventory. So the rest of this talk will look at the work of the resource assessments and what's involved in these. The project aims to unlock the potential of underexplored sedimentary basins in central Australia, particularly the Cooper Aramenga. This work follows an industry standard for assessing oil and gas prospectivity. AFER will expand the workflow to include assessments of porosity distribution for storage purposes, for unconventional resources, including CSG, shale gas and shale oil, and also for the presence of deep-seated hot aquifers and the potential hydrothermal mineral systems. Undertaking resource assessments requires a multidisciplinary approach 
And in the next few slides, I'm going to discuss the inputs as shown here uh, in more detail. One of the key uh, inputs is seismic reprocessing. As part of this project, Geoscience Australia has provided an additional 15,000 line kilometres of reprocessed data. Reprocessing phase one included 2,000 line kilometres in South Australia, and reprocessing phase two, 1,750 line kilometres, including 650 line kilometres in the NT. And this data is expected for release mid-2022. The purpose of this uh, seismic in terms of a resource assessment is to better understand structures and key stratigraphic packages, and these are needed for mapping of play intervals uh, for the resource assessment. We have here an example of uh, the seismic before reprocessing and then the seismic post reprocessing. And you can see here, there's been amazing uplift in the reprocessed data, particularly in the Mesozoic section. And this has provided improvement of stratigraphic correlation, which is needed for the play-based assessments. Post-drill analysis is another data set required for the resource assessments. Post-drill analysis is undertaken to understand the reason for well failures and or success. Identification of reservoir seal pairs, trapping mechanisms and charge are critical. Lack of hydrocarbon presence might mean the reservoir facies is still good enough for storage purposes. For example, this is the post-drill analysis for Conchera 1 and it shows that the primary cause of failure for the well was trap timing with the structure post-dating the late Cretaceous charge. There is limited evidence of charge with some indications that in the Burkhead and Katanaui play intervals. Post-drill analysis also shows the presence of potentially effective reservoir seal sections for geological storage in the Namamurta, Adori Westbourne and Hutton play intervals. The, this highlights that there is potential for stacked CO2 geological storage plays in the eastern part of the Polwana Trough. The Aramanga Basin has produced significant oil resources from the Jurassic and early Cretaceous reservoirs, where it overlies the Cooper Basin to the east of our assessment area. The South Australian part of the Aramanga Basin has already produced 215 million barrels of oil from these reservoirs. The figure on your right shows the production of oil in South Australian part of the Aramanga Basin at the play level using a well log from the Moomba field. This shows that most oil has been from either reservoirs in the middle Jurassic Hutton and Burkhead formation or from the early Cretaceous reservoirs in the Namo Sandstone or Murta formation. By contrast, there has been very little production from either the Adoree Sandstone or Westburn Bourne formations in South Australia this is consistent with previous studies in the Cooper Aramang petroleum systems by Lisa Hall and others shown in the bottom left and highlights the leaky nature of fluvial lacustrine seals in the Aramanga Basin. We can also see evidence for effective regional seals in the Cretaceous and marine shales and siltstones with virtually no oil reservoirs shown above the Wayandra sandstone. Let's now look at some of these plays more regionally. The map on the left is a play fairway map from the Namur recently published by the South Australian Department of Mines and Energy. It shows this conventional hydrocarbon play fairway extending over the southern and western flanks of the Polwana Trough based on where hydrocarbons migrate up from the early Jurassic and Permo-Triassic source rocks as the Polwana play pinches out. This play concept is supported by the residual oil shows at the top of the Akulbunga sandstone at Balmore 1. Our play interval interpretations show that there are also significant lateral variations in the shale content of the Burkhead play, numbered three, and the Adori Westbourne play, numbered four, with more shale prone sections to the east of the amalgamated sandstone sections to the west. This means that there are also potential for a series of stacked plays for conventional hydrocarbons in the east, if hydrocarbons have migrated vertically through the section. Importantly though, there is also significant potential for geological storage of CO2 if the plays include effective reservoir and seal intervals. This slide shows how an example of play information is extracted to use as an input for the resource assessment. This one is a series of cross sections published by the GAB study used to highlight the vertical and lateral heterogeneity of stratigraphic units in the Aramanga Basin where it overlies the Cooper Basin. The yellow colour fill highlights the sand prone intervals, while the brown colour fill highlights the silt and shale prone intervals. The cross section helps to highlight that rock units in the Jurassic to early Cretaceous part of the Aramanga Basin aren't showing a simple layer cake geology. 
Instead, we see significant variations in the ratio of sand versus shale, particularly within the fluvio-lacustrine seals, such as the Burkhead, Westbourne and Murta formations. This helps to understand why some of these intervals contain significant oil accumulations, and particularly why there are effectively no hydrocarbons trapped in the Adoree sandstone over the southwestern part of the cross section. So in closing, the Officer Musgrave project is investigating the groundwater and energy potential of the Officer Basin and neighbouring Musgrave province near the junction of South Australia, Western Australia and the NT borders. Geoscience Australia is providing new data to improve geological knowledge of the basin and its geological constraints. This work is expected to further improve the geological knowledge and reduce the energy exploration risk in the Officer Basin and we invite you to check out our web page and download any of the products there that interest you. Australia's Future Energy Resources Project is evaluating the potential for new energy commodities hosted within sedimentary basins, including oil, natural gas and hydrogen, to support Australia's transition to a low carbon economy. The project aims to unlock the potential of underexplored sedimentary basins in central Australia Previous work confirmed the presence of active petroleum systems and by examining why past exploration has failed, hopefully will shed new light on these basins and potentially identify new exploration opportunities. And we invite you to go to the web page and uh, check out the products there as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ladina, for providing that comprehensive overview. Our last speaker in this session is Dr. David Houston who will present on new mineral system insights. David is a senior economic geologist and principal research scientist in the mineral systems branch, working across a diverse range of mineral systems, including critical minerals. He completed his Masters of Science in Geology and Earth Sciences at the University of Arizona and a doctoral studies in economic geology at the University of Tasmania. Before joining Geoscience Australia, he held postdoctoral positions at the University of Tasmania and the Geological Survey of Canada. Good afternoon. Today I'm going to talk about how we've been integrating old data, sometimes with new data, to germinate new ideas and understandings in, of mineral systems and to encourage explorationists to look in new areas. Today I'm going to show three examples of this integration. This would not be possible without the efforts of colleagues here at Geoscience Australia and outside. As I said before, I will illustrate the integration of the old data using three examples. The first combines spatial and temporal data on mineral deposits with similar data on granites to understand the evolution of mineral deposits along convergent margins. The second links the same data for mineral deposits and magnetotelluric data to understand controls on the origin of orogenic gold deposits. The third uses geochemical data from ore samples to infer the origin of the deposits and to identify critical minerals potential. And finally, I have listed a number of the recent and pending data compilations so that you can have a look at, the, at those things later on. The first example is using old data to understand how mineral deposits fit spatially and temporally within tectonic cycles. The diagrams here show the location and association of mineral deposits during the three stages of an evolving convergent margin tectonic cycle. The first stage involves the subduction and the formation of volcanic arcs and back arc basins. During this stage, VHMS deposits form in back arc and calc alkaline porphyry copper deposits form along the arc. Perturbation of subduction, that is shallowing, accretion of an exotic block, and other things commonly lead to the second stage, orogenesis. This stage is accompanied by the formation of orogenic gold deposits. The third stage involves post-orogenic extension, during which alkalic porphyry copper deposits, pegmatites, and granite-related rare metal deposits form. We call this temporal progression the convergent margin tectonic cycle, or CMMC for short. In many convergent margins, particularly young margins, tectonic and metallogenic cycles commonly repeat themselves, with stage three transitioning into stage one and a second CMMC commencing. The metallogenesis of convergent margins in the Mesoarchean to Paleoproterozoic is generally relatively straightforward, as shown for the eastern gold fields in this slide. 
after a fairly minor event involving VHMS in orthomagmatic nickel sulfide deposits at about 2,800 million years. The main millenogenic history of the eastern gold fields is marked by a single CMMC, shown by the arrow here. This pattern is seen in other Neoarchean terrains, the Abitibi Wawa and Slave provinces, for example, as well as most Paleoproterozoic terrains, the Burimian, Trans Hudson, Yavapai, and Lambu Pine Creek. These are characterized by a single CMMC that lasted 80 to 150 million years, followed by craterization and shutting down of metallogenesis. As you can see by comparing this slide with the last one, younger convergent margins have much longer and much more complicated metallogenic history than the Neoarchean to Paleoproterozoic margins. This is a diagram showing the evolution of the Tasman element. I will unpack it in the next few slides, but it is similar to other Paleophanerozoic uh, convergent margins, the Northern Cordillera, the Appalachians, the Central Asian orogenic system, and the Himalayan Alpine systems. This is consistent with fundamental differences between the Neoarchean to Paleoproterozoic and the Phanerozoic tectonics and metallogenesis. So the most significant CMMC in Eastern Australia is the one associated with the Benambran tectonic cycle. This metallogenic cycle saw the formation of Benambran aged orogenic gold deposits in Western Victoria, Bendigo and Ballarat, and the formation of porphyry copper deposits in the Macquarie Arc, Cadia and Ganumbla. In Southeast Australia, the Benambran cycle began with VHMS deposits in the Triton, in, in the Triton district, followed by calc alkaline porphyry copper deposits, such as Copper Hill. These were followed by orogenic gold deposits in association with the Benambran or orogeny. These gold deposits are almost exclusively restricted to Western Victoria. Alkalic porphyry copper deposits followed in the Macquarie Arc, and the Benambran cycle in southeastern Australia was concluded by granite-related rare metal deposits and minor pegmatite deposits. In northern Australia, known Benambran cycle deposits are mainly VHMS deposits in the Mount Windsor and Balcooma districts. This cycle was fairly short, lasting about 70 million years. It may be associated with the accretion of Vandy land onto southeast Australia as proposed by Ross Kelly. So that's the Benambran cycle. Now we'll look at a second cycle, the Mossman cycle. It's mostly restricted to Mossman origin in northern Queensland, with one deposit from the New England origin, Mount Morgan. This is assigned to this cycle as a VHMS deposit. The cycle started with VHMS deposits in the Hodgkinson province, followed by orogenic gold deposits, and then by granite-related rare metal deposits. This cycle, like the earlier Delamarian and later New England cycles, are spatially and temporally restricted. It's only restricted to North, North Queensland. And there you see the cycle as we've interpreted. So in summary, the metallogenic history of the Tasman element can be subdivided into five temporally and spatially constrained convergent margin metallogenic cycles. The Delamarian, the Benambran, the Canimblin, the Mossman, and the Hunter-Bowman cycles. These metallogenic cycles correspond to the tectonic cycles as discussed by Champion et al. 2009 and probably relate to tectonic perturbances that have affected the Tasman convergent margin. Similar multiple tectonic cycles are also present in other late Neoproterozoic to Phanerozoic convergent margins that we've assessed elsewhere on the globe. Although beyond the scope of this talk, we believe that these differences relate to the evolution of tectonic processes through time on Earth. These patterns can be used to predict the spatial and temporal distribution of mineral deposits, both in well-known and, importantly, in poorly known convergent margin in Australia and around the world. So in addition to understanding metallogenic patterns at the, at the element scale, the deposits and geochronological database that we've developed at GA can be used to test the relationships between melogeny and other aspects of geology. In the next couple of slides, I'll discuss one such application. In the 1990s, Lance Black from GA observed that there was a spatial younging of Devonian granites from east to west in Tasmania. Using the data sets that we have developed, we wanted to test this concept for, different, for similar patterns in de mineral deposits of Devonian age. 
The diagram to your left shows you the relationship between the ages of Devonian granite-related deposits, intrusion-related gold, and granite-related rare metal deposits in Southeast Australia. As you can see, the ages of the granite-related gold deposits young towards the west on both sides of the, mass of, of the Bass Straits. This is not restricted to Tasmania, and you can see the trend there. The fact that the relationship held on both sides of the Bass Strait was actually a bit of a surprise. So we extracted from our database zircon uranium lead ages from granites from all over Southeast Australia from 420 to 350 million years. Lo and behold, a similar relationship existed, again, on both sides of Bass Strait, as you can see here. But of more interest was that there seemed to be a second younging trend on the mainland older than about 390 million years, which you can see in that trend right there. So we decided to investigate that trend in more detail. To see if the younger trend was real, the diagram on the left shows all zircon uranium lead granite ages for Southeast Australia. As you can see from the data, they do define two younging trends in the granite data. A trend for granites between 450 million years and 390 million years, and a second trend for granites between 405 and 355 million years. Spatially, the older trend occurs in the northern part of the Lachlan, whereas the younger trend occurs in the southern Lachlan and into Tasmania. We have plotted the distribution of granite-related rare metal deposits, intrusion-related gold, and alkalic porphyry copper deposits. As you can see, that these deposits follow the same granite younging trends for both the northern older trend and the southern younger trend. Importantly, orogenic gold deposits from western Victoria plot off the younging trend, as do calcalic porphyry copper deposits in the Macquarie Arc. We have also used the data set to look at the spatial temporal distribution of orogenic gold deposits in the Yilgarn, following the observation from Michael Dublier. As you can see, there is a broad younging trend in orogenic gold deposits from east to west, as suggested by Michael. I've just shown you a couple of examples to illustrate how our data sets can be used to query and generate new observations on the spatial and temporal distribution of mineral deposits. I've only shown the results of the queries. We are currently trying to make sense of what these mean in terms of tectonics and other implications. More of that in the future. We also believe the observations can be used to generate new exploration concepts. For example, it might be expected that 310 to 410 million year old granite related deposits would be expected on the western end of the older train. This might be suggestive of granite related potential of this age in western Victoria and into South Australia. Now I'm going to move tack entirely and look at the relationship between convergent margin mineral deposits and magnetotelluric data. As many of you will know, work by Graham Heinsen and co-workers have shown a striking relationship between MT data and the distribution of iron oxide copper gold deposits. The next couple of slides illustrate the results of Alison Kirkby that was published a couple of months ago in Nature Scientific Reports. The two diagrams in this slide show the distribution of orogenic gold deposits, porphyry copper and VHMS deposits relative to conductive models constructed using MT data collected as part of GA's OSLAMP MT data acquisition program. The one on the left is the 25 kilometer depth slice, and the one on the right is the 60 kilometer depth slice. In both diagrams, red indicate conductive crusts, whereas blue indicates resistive crusts. As you can see, there is a reasonably good correlation between orogenic gold deposits shown as circles and the conductive anomalies in the 25 kilometer depth slice. The same relationship is noted elsewhere in the world, for example, in the Western United States, suggesting that this relationship may apply globally. Allison has developed some new diagrams that can be used to better understand the relationship between the MT and the distribution of the deposit types. The left diagram here shows the cumulative distribution functions of the observed deposit distribution versus that expected if the distribution pattern was random. They are calculated for a specific depth loss. If the distribution of the deposit is random, the observed distribution of the deposit should overlap the random distribution, and the difference between the observed and random values should be zero, i.e. d. 
If the distribution of the deposit is not random with respect to the MT depth slice, differences will be positive. The right-hand diagram shows the variations in D function as respect, with respect to the edge of the 100 ohm meter contour. This diagram indicates that orogenic gold deposits are on average located just outside between 0 and 20 kilometers, the 100 ohm meter conductors at a depth of 20 to 35 kilometers. The probability of this relationship between uh, being random is 10 to the minus 22, uh, very, very unlikely. This data has genetic implications, which I will not go into, but it also has expiration implications as shown in the next slide. Looking at the 25 kilometer depth slice may indicate potential for orogenic gold deposits in underexplored areas. As for example, MT conductive anomalies extend into the southern Murray Basin, suggested orogenic gold deposits may extend into this region. There are several prospects known in this region. The data, however, suggests that this potential is constrained to the southern part of the basin. In addition, MT conductive anomalies extend west from the Victorian gold fields into the Delamarian. This and the concept of convergent margin metallogenic cycles, as discussed before, may suggest that there's unrealized potential for Delamarian gold in far west Victoria into South Australia. There are minor known Delamarian gold deposits in South Australia. The last thing I want to talk about is some work that Yevgeny Bastrikov has been doing. We, along with the USGS and the GSC, have been, been compiling geochemical data on ore samples as part of the Critical Ma Minerals Mapping Initiative. As part of this, we are developing tools to compare the geochemistry of these deposits. This diagram shows an example of one of these tools. These diagrams are called radar diagrams and can be used to compare the geochemistry of the deposits. The left diagram compares the geochemistry of the Olympic Dam and Prominent Hill deposits, illustrating the geochemical similarity of these deposits. Both of these are classified as hematite-rich iron oxide copper gold deposits. The diagram on the right compares Olympic Dam with Ernest Henry, illustrate that there are some important differences within the overall IOCG class of deposits. Although Olympic Dam is more enriched in rare earth elements, Ernest Henry is rich in elements such as rhenium, cobalt, and tungsten. This may indicate that subclasses within deposit class types have different potential for critical minerals and that the geochemistry can be used as a classification uh, tool for unknown deposits. In the last 15 minutes, I hope that I've shown you the potential for integrating geological, geophysical, geochemical, and isotopic data sets to better understand controls on metallogenesis and to identify new targets for mineral exploration. The thing I want to stress is the potential for new insights into exploration. The diagram on the left shows that many sediment-hosted zinc deposits are spatially associated with the mid-crust MT resistive zone, a totally unexpected relationship. We see a similar relation with upward continued gravity data, the depth of the lithospheric asthenospheric boundary, and lead isotope data. Five years ago, we would not have imagined such relationships existed. I think that we will discover more such relationship as we continue to integrate data as I've shown you this afternoon. Lastly, I'd like to thank the audience for their attention and also my co-workers listed below for their hard work and insights. Thank you, David. As always, an insightful talk. This brings us to our question and answer session for the systems theme.